Hello you beautiful audience. This is Reddit Stories. And today's topic is. 3 Creepy Stories. Part 52. Story 1. The Ship from Hell. Old sailors recount their stories at the old harbor, where I've lived since I was a child. It's a tradition as old as the harbor itself. Some stories, such as the Flying Dutchman, came from here, but the majority vanished like a shipwreck at sea. The residents here do not want attention, nor do they desire fame or glory. They would rather spend their final days reminiscing about the past. I'd describe them as scarred and shattered. They've seen much too much and gained far too little. Sailors used to perish at sea, now they die alone in an obscure tavern, surrounded by strangers. Like them, their stories pass away never to be told again. It breaks my heart to think of those lost memories. These frail people's knowledge and experience that have vanished. I wanted to change that, to become immersed in the stories they all tell. My peers cautioned me not to, telling me to accept the situation as it is. But I don't want another memory to be gone with a sailor's grave, so I started going to obscure taverns and meeting new sailors and letting them share their stories as I wrote them down. I wrote down dozens of stories, each one more upsetting or weird than the previous. I preserved them all in my book in the hopes that they would never be forgotten. It was a stunning collection that would make anyone think twice about boarding a ship and setting sail. Despite this, every sailor I spoke with said it wasn't the worst story they'd ever heard. Each sailor had heard a story that was even more unsettling or frightening than their own. The one they had crowned as the most disturbing sailor tale was from a man named Ed. Ed's name is as straightforward as the man himself. He always goes to the same bar, drinks the same pint, and leaves at the same time. He seldom returns home and always sleeps alone in a freezing bed on the floor. Ed is a burdened man who can no longer cope with the outside world. He waits for death to greet him, and he will gladly greet it back. Finding him was thus not difficult, knowing the name of one of several obscure pubs, it did not take long for me to locate him. He sat behind one of the wooden tables, holding two pints, one half full and one empty. Ed seems to have lost all hope in life. It was common for old sailors who lived here to have that, but his had a deeper meaning. As if an additional burden has been placed on him. I approached him and inquired whether he was the Ed that all the sailors were talking about. As I spoke to him, he became shocked, as if no one ever spoke to him anymore. I informed him that many people had told me about him and that I was interested in learning more about his stories. He merely shook his head and went about his business. It wasn't the first time a sailor turned down my offer, but thankfully I was fluent in their language. I walked up to the bar and ordered a more expensive rum. I took the bottle and set it down in front of Ed. His eager gaze betrayed him, for he wanted to try the rum. I offered him the bottle in exchange for the story. He accepted and was even generous enough to share the bottle I had given him. While we were drinking, I asked as to who he was and what he did. Ed had literally explored the seven seas when he wasn't old and withered. During the Vietnam War, he transported supplies to Americans while under intense fire. He sailed in the Bohan Cyclone in 1970. He aided numerous impoverished countries devastated by disasters by giving supplies to those nations in need. His life was in risk several times, but he didn't care. He lived for it and didn't want anything else. He was more careful in his later years. He continued to sail the oceans, but with less risk and more time on land. The sea, on the other hand, was his obsession and his one love. He imagined his last days at sea, which earned him a sailor's funeral. But he is now afraid of the water, and despite his strong desire to return, his mind and body are resisting him. It was because of his experience with the so-called ship from hell, as he described it. Talking about it, though, caused his eyes to widen and his breathing to become strained. When I saw his cracked face, agitated eyes, and grey dry hair, I knew he was worried for a long time. I also knew he wanted to tell me, 
that he needed to tell me, but he couldn't. I bought him a couple glasses of courage and waited for him to work up more confidence. His need for more was obvious, but I needed him to be sober enough to share his story. He finally snapped and shoved his drink away. I saw a spark of a real person with goals and dreams in his eyes for the first time, but they all vanished away as he said the first words regarding his event. When Ed was still a sailor, he packed his belongings from a little motel and boarded the Reliance on the eve of an autumn day. As his ship drifted on the water, he could already feel the chill of winter. The cargo was only a standard delivery. This time, their shipment included a variety of herbs and cheese. Ed's expression went sour as he described the unpleasant smell emerging from the cargo deck. The voyage, according to Ed, was going swimmingly. There were no ominous clouds on the horizon, and the waves were as peaceful as an old dog dozing on his bench. Then, in a matter of seconds, a storm descended on them. It was a one-of-a-kind storm. It appeared as though a war between heaven and hell had started, and a power that could only destroy had been unleashed. The ocean may be merciless in this way, but usually they would be notified if a storm was approaching, especially one of this magnitude. They had to hold to faith for their lives and that their ship would survive. Ed expressed sadness that one of the men had fallen overboard and been carried away by the waves. It rained and poured from the sky for hours, and everyone counted their dying seconds. However, as fast as the storm began, it also ended. The storm had passed in the blink of an eye, and clear blue sky could be seen once more. They immediately mourned their deceased sailor before examining all of their equipment. The ship had survived, but most of the equipment had perished, and they had seemingly veered off track. It would be another week or more before they saw land again. It was unfortunate since they needed a break after this weird occurrence, but they had enough food, and the ship was not sinking. They sailed through uncharted and unfamiliar waters for the next two days. There wasn't much known about this area of the sea, and not many ships went there. The winds got calmer, and the waves scarcely rippled, making things even stranger. It all came to a halt eventually, with just the ripples of their ships visible in the motionless ocean. As a heavy fog crept around the ship, silence covered the seas. Even the ship's crew remained silent as they glanced at the sea and sensed something was wrong. One of the seamen eventually broke the stillness by alerting them to the presence of another ship nearby. The odd ship cruised alongside the Reliance and seemed to be damaged. For a few hours, the ship followed them on their path. The captain attempted to reach them but heard only radio static. The sailors on deck couldn't take their gaze away from the ship, something pulled them in. Ed told me he felt the same way about it, like if something was calling to him. The captain sensed something was wrong and instructed his men to remain on deck and avoid doing anything foolish. He looked to be frightened that other guys might try to board it, despite the fact that there was still plenty of water between the two boats. This changed when the mysterious ship abruptly reversed course and headed directly in the direction of the Reliance. It took the captain everything he had not to smash the Reliance into the other ship. The danger was past, but both ships were now adjacent to one other. Ed characterized it as like a pirate boarding, but without any pirates, sailors, or anything else. The crew waited for anything to happen, but the odd vessel seemed to be deserted. It appeared as though the ship, or whatever was directing it, wanted them to board it. They were all terrified of it, yet they were all drawn towards it. The ship, according to Ed, was old and rusted. It had not been maintained in a long time, and beams and cranes were crumbling apart. The strange ship's deck was dirty and plagued with hazardous holes into which anyone may fall. The bridge's stairs were likewise rusted and missing a few steps. The bridge itself was abandoned, and it seemed as though the ship's name had originally been written on it but had been scratched off. It still sends shivers down Ed's spine as he recalls his first experience with the horror ship. He understood then, as he knows now, that nothing good could have come from that ship, but he and his crew were naive. They were too intrigued by the vessel, or too surprised by it, to think clearly. 
so, they attempted to enter it. The captain cautioned them, but he felt a draw towards it as well. So, he joined the rest of the crew and boarded the odd ship. Ed, like the rest of the crew, boarded the ship as well. As he stepped on its deck, he felt a strange sensation. It felt as if they were being observed by something unseen. Ed almost fell through a weak part of deck when he stood on it. He would have fallen into it if it hadn't been for the captain grabbing him just in time. Something moved as he looked down into the hole he was about to fall into. There was something there, but he couldn't see it clearly enough. Still, it didn't feel right, and he wanted to leave. The rest of the crew, on the other hand, wanted to go even further. The captain sent a few members of his crew to proceed to the bridge in the hopes of learning more about this ship and determining who or what it belonged to. The captain wanted Ed to go as well since he was the most trustworthy of all the sailors under his charge. Reluctantly Ed went, not wanting to disobey the captain's orders. When they reached the bridge, it was a shambles of rubbish and old broken items. Many maps were ruined, and the steering wheel appeared to have perished. It's no surprise that ship steered so poorly. They searched through the objects on a shelf to check whether there was any visible name, location, or date. There wasn't much information to be uncovered, but Ed claimed that he did ultimately find the captain's name and a photo of the ship. Despite the fact that everything appeared distorted and out of place. The captain's expression in the photograph seemed unusual, as if he was afraid or disheartened by something. Ed intended to show the photo to the rest of the crew, but he was abruptly halted by a cold, menacing breeze coming from a door heading farther inside the ship. A sailor who did not belong to the Reliance's crew stood at the door's entrance. He was as white as snow, his lips were blue, and his clothing were torn and ripped. In an instant, the mood on the bridge shifted. Everyone's gaze was locked on the sailor, and they appeared to be paralyzed, unable to move. Ed could hear his heartbeat pounding out of his chest as he struggled to move his body. The weird sailor appeared to be deceased and unreal, and everything about him was horrible and wrong. They should have all fled at that point, raced back to the Reliance, and hoped that the ship would not follow them. Nonetheless, they stood there, waiting for that creature to do anything. Minutes passed with no one doing anything, even the strange sailor stood there observing them. After what seemed like hours, the odd sailor said in a creaky voice, come, and walked back through the door he had just opened. They moved again as mindless zombies, this time following the odd thing that had summoned them. The weird sailor just walked beneath the deck and deeper into the ship's underbelly. They followed him, mindless as they were, and Ed went behind them, without knowing why or how. The deeper they went, the darker it became. A few lights on the ship were still on, giving them a general idea of how things appeared. However, it was not a beautiful sight. For, as Ed described, the rooms and passageways were strewn with filth, rust, and unidentified things. Some doors to specific rooms had what seemed to be nail marks on them. One wall appeared to be coated with dried blood, it was a horror show, and no normal person should ever go there in their right mind. Ed wanted to go, he needed to leave, but he couldn't. It got heavier to just go away with each step he went deeper in. Every room he entered got grimmer and more ominous. He also noticed some scribbled not to trust it on the wall. He wanted to go, but he just kept walking. As they approached the end of a hallway, the mysterious sailor came to a halt. There was just one door that didn't look like any of the others. The odd sailor reached for the doorknob and pulled it open. He then turned around, grinning at all the people who had followed him. Someone had finally mustered the confidence to say something, but the strange sailor cut him off by raising his grey, pallid half-dead finger towards his lips and hissed. Go in there, he murmured, as though suffocating, and gasping for breath. The weird sailor appeared to be having difficulty speaking. He walked down a stairwell after entering the door. Nobody knew where the steps would go or what awaited them at the bottom. It was too dark to see anything, but the air was foul and seemed like everything was wrong. 
Still, they pursued him, although more cautiously. Nobody said anything, and no one questioned it. However, everyone appeared to be terrified and unwilling to be there. Ed, too, who used all of his strength to resist following the odd stranger. He remained in front of the entrance, watching all of his crew members go into the darkness. Ed knew something terrible would happen, but his urge to go along was so strong. As he took his first step through the door, he noticed the frightening stairway leading farther down. When he glanced at the door, he noticed that it was covered with hundreds of scratches and dried up blood. It was enough for him to break free from the trance and take his first step back. Ed took another step back, witnessing the fellow in front of him, a young chef named Sam, be the last to vanish in the darkness. Only the cold sound of people walking down the steel steps could be heard at this point. For a little minute, he was at a loss for what to do. Did he have to return? Should he go after the other members of the crew? He was lost and in despair, but he made his decision when he heard a horrific cry coming from below. It was a piercing cry of agony, terror, and dread. Ed instantly turned back and fled through that door. He waited at the end of the hall, hoping to see another member of his crew. But what he saw terrified him. It was the weird sailor who stepped out of the door, not one of his crew members. He glared angrily at Ed and shrieked at him in a weird but horrifying tongue. Ed whirled back and dashed for the exit. Hearing the odd sailor rushing after him, he raced as fast as he could. Ed was surprised he remembered how to get back to the bridge, but he knew the weird sailor was right behind him. He could feel the chilly touch of the sailor's fingers on his neck at one point, attempting to grip him and drag him down with the others. The odd sailor screamed at him, but Ed simply continued running and running. After what felt like an age, he strolled through the bridge's entrance and onto the deck. He yelled at everyone to get off the weird ship and abandon it right now. To Ed's astonishment, everyone had already departed the ship and were calling at him to do the same. He rushed towards the Reliance, almost entering it before pausing for a brief glance back. He could see the sailor's figure standing on the bridge, staring at him in cold blood. He then boarded the Reliance, feeling the weight of abandoning his crew members on that ship. The captain questioned Ed where the other four guys who were with him were when they were secure aboard the ship. Ed merely shook his head, but the captain could tell something terrible had happened by the look on his face. At that moment, Sam, the young cook who had followed like Ed the odd sailor, raced on deck pleading to be saved as they were about to exit. He was personally escorted off the ship and returned to the Reliance by the captain. Sam was beneath the staircase and had watched what that creature had done, and it was to be noticed that it wasn't something good. The once young-looking chef had grey hair and heavy eyes. His skin was pale, and he was murmuring to himself. He was covered with bizarre unknown stuff and refused to tell anyone about it. When the captain saw the young boy, he immediately ordered them to depart and proceed to the nearest port they could locate. As they sailed away, the crew observed the odd ship, which had been dubbed the ship from hell. As they watched, they noticed the strange sailor descend from the bridge to the deck. Another crew member walked behind him, screaming and pleading to be saved. Despite the fact that everyone wanted to help him, no one did. Even the captain, with tears streaming down his cheeks, dismissed it. For days on end, the screams of the unfortunate sailor on the ship from hell echoed on the water. They felt terrible leaving him there with that awful creature. Sam never mentioned anything he had seen or heard. He was plagued by nightmares and looked to be in a state of perpetual shock. After four days, they discovered his cold body above his bed and buried him like a sailor. Ed's sailing days had come to an end. He gave up sailing and became a carpenter. He had no desire to return to the water, but after ten years of living in dread, he desired to break it. He re-enlisted as a sailor and returned to his favorite sea. He informed me that the sighting of the ship in the distance still tormented him. He tried to dismiss it, reasoning that it was all in his head. Only it wasn't. The identical accident occurred as it did ten years before. 
The mysterious ship pursued them and nearly collided with them. His new crew and captain wanted to embark, but Ed, aware of the horrors, stopped them. He warned everyone and insisted that they leave the ship alone. Fortunately, the captain listened, and they sailed away. As they sailed away, he noticed the odd sailor on deck, who was staring at him angrily. The crew member they had left behind all those years ago appeared next to the strange sailor. He looked dreadful and appeared to be in a lot of pain. He tried to scream, but no sound came out of his throat. Ed can still picture his frantic expression when he shuts his eyes to this day. Ed vowed never to become a sailor or board a ship again after that day. He is now spending his life at a pub, seeking to forget what happened to him all those years ago. But he is still plagued by that ship, for a part of him never fled and longs for him to return. I could see it in him, and for a little moment, he appeared to be deceased himself. Story 2 The Figure I grew up in a household that rarely attended church. Sometimes, when visiting our grandparents, my two brothers and I would be forced to go to worship services, but those moments were few and far between. Even so, it is almost impossible to avoid running across Christian symbols in books, movies, and television shows. Thus, it is likely most Americans have at least a basic understanding of such Christian symbols as the cross and angelic beings. So, when my youngest brother, Parker, of around three years old began telling us that he saw angels, my parents saw no immediate cause for concern, nor were they all that surprised. From what I can remember, all of the adults in the family and in our friends' circles thought it was cute. I must admit I was a bit more skeptical than the grown-ups. Quite frankly, I could not shake an unsettling feeling deep in my gut that something about it was not right. Some time later, my brothers and I were spending a summer day at our babysitter's mind-numbingly boring home when my youngest brother called out for someone to come and look at a picture he had just finished. Now. Being all of three years old, abstract shapes and outrageous color schemes constituted the bulk of my brother's artwork up to this point. At least, this is the level of work we were all used to and fully expected to see. As it happens, I was the first to arrive on the scene and lay eyes on the drawing. The first thing I noticed, to my astonishment, was the lack of color. In fact, the entire drawing consisted of various shades of black, which was completely out of character in my brother's case. Before I was even aware of what I had laid eyes upon, a cold chill was creeping up my spine, causing the hairs on the back of my neck to stand on end. The next thing I could not avoid being struck by was the seemingly miraculous leap forward in this three-year-old boy's artistic ability. I could actually make out the discernible details of a figure, demonstrating ability well beyond his years. Without regard to the figure on the page, I immediately felt something scandalous must be afoot. I marched over to our middle brother, Christian, fully intent upon drawing a confession out of him. He must have sketched the figure and conspired to have a little fun at my expense. I was not laughing. I couldn't shake this feeling of being disturbed, much like the one I would get from creepy pictures or statues that seemed to stare directly into my soul. When he pled his innocence, I quickly dragged Christian over to the table and demanded he end his charade. However, the moment his eyes met the figure, I recognized the look on his face. I imagined it must have been exactly as I had looked upon viewing the figure only moments before. Tears began to stream from his eyes, as I released his arm and watched him race over to the secure arms of his favorite teddy bear. He always had that bear with him but I had not seen him act as he did in that moment in years. He was three all over again. I was beginning to feel sweat beating up on my forehead and the back of my neck. I turned to Parker, who had not moved from his spot at the table throughout the entirety of the commotion, his face displaying a confused look. As the oldest, not wanting to leave the responsibility to our babysitter, I decided I would inquire about the figure. The figure. Up to this point I had not even considered what exactly my brother had drawn. All I knew was it was chilling me to the bone, and I could not understand why. I would soon have my answer. 
Before launching into my interrogation, I glanced back at the shadowy figure on the paper. Why had I not spent a moment to figure out what he had drawn? Was it my subconscious attempting to protect me from identifying it? These questions run through my brain every time I lie awake in bed at night, some 20 plus years later, wary of what may be waiting for me in the darkest corners of my room, behind the door, and under my bed. Some things just stick with you and tend to rear their ugly head at the worst moments. What I saw on the paper haunts me to this day, even as my fingers type the words at this very moment. The drawing was of a dark, shadowy figure, partly veiled in what appeared to be smoke or possibly mist. The body was nude, and the limbs and torso were contorted in grotesquely unnatural fashion. Tears were welling up in my eyes, as I scanned the figure, slowly drifting up toward its face. This face was something indescribably sinister and horrid. It had no business even being a figment of imagination, much less being sketched by a three-year-old. I cannot, after all of these years, find something even remotely like it to compare. It did not exactly have eyes, but you felt like it was staring right through you, like it knew you. I felt like it knew more about me than I knew myself. Yet, there was something oddly familiar about the figure. What I suppose could possibly pass for a mouth stretched from the middle of its lopsided, egg-shaped head, all the way to the very bottom of its face. Impossible as it may seem, the figure appeared to be smiling and whispering at the same time. For some reason I felt like it was asking me to remember. Remember what? Looking up at my three-year-old brother, with his blue eyes and innocent expression, I could not believe such a vision of utter darkness and cruelty could spring forth from his young and inexperienced mind. Was this something he thought about often? Had he dreamt it and felt compelled to put it down on paper? If he was at all frightened by the image, as Christian and I clearly were, he was not showing the slightest sign. I could only bring myself to ask him a single question, why? Just then, Christian accidentally knocked the television remote to the floor, momentarily snapping me out of the dramatic heaviness of the moment. He still looked mortified. I turned to the three-year-old behind me, realizing there might just be some mystery about to be revealed, and heard the words I immediately realized were the cause of my unease with the figure. He simply smiled and said, I see him every day. He's my angel. Upon hearing this, something seemed to break inside me. It was as if some switch flipped and an impossibly dim light flickered to life in a dark and distant room. A faded memory from as far back as I can remember began to take shape. On the couch behind me, Christian began sobbing loudly. He was definitely his three-year-old self, squeezing his teddy bear, and moaning that he wanted our mother. Something from within compelled me to go over to him. It was not a voice, but it was definitely a feeling. I was out of my element. We needed mom and dad. The babysitter was not going to be enough. Something was seriously wrong, and we did not have any answers. The moment I sank into the couch, my brother threw his teddy bear and wrapped his arms around me. This was certainly new. We loved each other, about as much as two young brothers can hope to love one another, but the only times we ever hugged were for family pictures. And yet, I could tell that it was the most appropriate thing the two of us could do in that moment. He needed it. I needed it. Without looking up at me, through alternating sobs and snivels, he began to speak. He told me he wished he had never looked at the figure. He asked me why I had made him do it, which drove a hot dagger right through my little heart. I began to cry once again, telling him I was sorry in my own whimpering voice. After we sat there crying for what seemed like an hour, though it was likely mere minutes, my brother once again spoke. This time he seemed oddly calm, almost as if he had not been crying and shaking with fear for the past several minutes. While he spoke, my attention was fading in and out, as he recounted the various houses we had lived in and the rooms we shared over the years. I had no idea why he was bringing any of this up at this particular moment. He continued in this manner, 
and I began to just be able to make out the memory that had moments before been triggered at the table and was slowly coming into focus. It was a series of short scenes, mostly in an apartment my parents rented when I was around three or four years old. Some of them were of places I could not quite make out, but I assumed they represented my grandparents' old house and the daycare center I once attended. They were old memories of old places. Before I could make these images more concrete and begin to try to remember their significance, I was ripped from my trance-like state by something my brother said. He was asking me if I remembered his imaginary friend. He said he used to think it was his guardian angel. I, myself, was around nine when he used to talk about his imaginary friend, and I tended to just ignore him when he spoke about it. I did remember, however, a time when I awoke to the sound of my brother whispering. I remember rolling over so that I could smack him and tell him to go to sleep but immediately being startled by the sound of a deep, raspy voice that seemed to be responding to him. I must have blocked it out, but at that moment I could suddenly recall that that night I ran straight into our parents' room, waking them up and going on and on about a man in our room. Unfortunately, when my parents finally got up and went to investigate, my brother was sound asleep, and nothing was amiss. The window was closed and locked, the bed was clear underneath, and our closet only housed a few sweatshirts and board games. As this was all coming back to me, my own memory began to sharpen and reveal itself. It was as if a movie was being played on fast forward of select moments from my early childhood. As an only child for the first few years of my life, it was not uncommon for me to have to settle on entertaining myself. Strangely enough, though, in the images streaming through my brain, a figure began to materialize. Frame by frame, as the scenes repeated themselves over and over again, a growing dark mist or smoke was taking shape. Christian had lost his temporary state of calmness and returned to sobbing uncontrollably, but the images continued to hold my attention. What was that thing in each of the scenes with me? Why did I feel some connection to it? The sobs of my brother grew into full-on wailing. Still, I could not be brought out of my current state. I had to know what my memory was trying to show me. At some point, my curiosity began to change to an all-too-familiar feeling of dread. I was coming to the realization that I knew exactly what was in those rooms with me. I had always known. I did not want to see it in its full form, but I could not look away. The images were in my head, not in front of my eyes. I could feel tears streaming once again down my cold, clammy face. I was sweating profusely and shivering uncontrollably, like one continuous chill running up and down my spine. It started with that unmistakable stench. It seemed to roll off of him like the smoke that surrounded his presence. Then I saw that hideously familiar naked body, with all of its twists and inhuman angles. I could hear a faint noise rising from somewhere in the background. No, it was welling up from inside me. I was screaming. The last thing I remembered before blacking out was that ungodly face, crooked and ghastly, somehow smiling without a mouth and seeing right into my soul with non-existent eyes. And to think, I now can vividly remember, that three-year-old me used to be comforted by this hideous creature. He was my guardian angel. Story 3. The Mist. One day, on a foggy night, I was walking home from a party. It was about 2 a.m. and a black mist suddenly fell around me. I didn't know what it was, but I wasn't scared, so I started to walk away, but then it looked like the black mist was following me. So then I start to walk fast and the black mist was also going fast, like it was stalking me. I tripped on a Bud Light beer bottle and fell. The black mist caught up to me and as I stood up it was all around me. I started to panic. Then a big black face showed up in front of me. I'll never forget that face, it had big evil looking red eyes and sharp white teeth. It came closer and closer, and closer, then it said in deep a distorted whisper, you are not the one. The black mist went away into the night trying to find the one he was looking for. Who was it searching for? And why? 
Has anyone else seen this mysterious mist? This marks the end of the video. If you like my content, consider subscribing as it helps me a lot. See you until next time.